Okay, so starting on our endocrine system. Uh, the endocrine system is talking about uh, things that go into the blood, chemicals called hormones, and they go into the blood and they travel around the body and they act on the target cells. Um, so this is a form of cell signaling, which you've seen other forms of cell signaling in um, AMP1 with neurons, where one neuron is communicating with another neuron or a neuron is communicating with a muscle. Um, that cell is signaling to another cell. And in this case, we have a hormone being made by one cell and it's going out into the blood and it's signaling or, or communicating with another cell um, somewhere else in the body. So it's a slower form of cell signaling than what we saw with the nervous system. Um, and it, because it involves hormones and they have to get into the blood and they have to travel through the blood and all that sort of thing. Um, now we also have some sorts of um, chemicals that are similar to hormones. They may even be exactly chemically the same as a hormone but they would be called paracrine factors. And the difference between a paracrine factor and a hormone is that a paracrine factor is going to be um, acting locally, acting only in the tissue of origin. Um, now that's a bit of a fuzzy line, so, so is it acting just in the organ where it's created, just the tissue that's created, or just nearby adjacent tissues? Um, that's sort of, you know, a little bit of a, a fuzzy line between where you draw the line of do you strictly call it a paracrine factor or has it gone a little bit too far so now it's a hormone. But And they can be exactly the same chemical. So um, there's a little bit of overlap between what we would think of as endocrine and paracrine. Um, now there's also autocrine factors. And these are for the cell to communicate with itself, essentially. So one part of the cell to communicate um, inside the cell. So this would be intracellular signaling where paracrine factors and the endocrine system would be extracellular signaling. And that will be covered in, um, in, in the video assignment that you have for the endocrine system, which is just dealing with the endocrine system um, in general um, and there are thought questions involved with that as well. Um, and that's posted on Blackboard in your, in your content folder, in the exam one folder. But what we're going to be talking about for this video um, are hormones and how they act on the target cell. So what are the ways that they can have an effect on the target cell? Um, and this should sound somewhat familiar to you because it's very much exactly the same as the way neurons um, and neurotransmitters interact with each other in that we are most typically dealing with something called a membrane-bound receptor. So that's a receptor on the membrane. That means that the hormone doesn't go inside the cell. It stays outside the cell. It never goes in. And it binds to the receptor and it causes um, reactions to happen within the cell. Now, for neurotransmitters, you saw um, somewhere we might open an ion channel or where we might have second messengers. And that second messenger system, that's what um, we're going to be dealing with with our hormones. So when we have our second messenger systems, that receptor is said to be G protein coupled. So there would be a G protein that's inactive until the hormone binds on the inside of the cell and it's kind of stuck to the receptor. So when the hormone binds to the receptor, it changes the shape of the receptor, which activates the G protein, and then a bunch of chemical reactions happen inside the cell and cause whatever the effect may be, whether it's to stimulate the cell or if it's to inhibit the cell. Um, and among those chemical reactions, you'll get a product that's called a second messenger, um, which is just the chemical that, that that is essentially telling the cell what to do. Is it telling it to make more of whatever it is that that cell makes, or is it telling it to have an action potential? Um, is it telling it to um, be inhibited, to break down, um, and to not make whatever it is that it makes, whatever that action might be. So we're going to look at some second messenger systems. Um, now this will be most hormones, because most hormones cannot pass across the cell memory. There are exceptions, and um, where we have cells that can, or hormones that can go inside the cell by passing through the cell membrane, and for those we'll have intracellular receptors. Um, the examples of hormones that can do that would be lipid-soluble hormones, like steroid hormones, so we're thinking um, estrogen or testosterone, things like that. 
um, anything that is made of um, fat could get through the cell membrane. Um, or there are hormones that have specific protein channels for them. For example, our thyroid hormones, um, T3 or T4 are the names of the thyroid hormones. Um, they have receptors or channels that allow them to pass through the cell membrane and then allow them to bind to receptors inside the cell. So if we do have receptors inside the cell, or where we do have receptors inside the cell, they're going to be in one of two places. Um, one on the nucleus. If it's in the nucleus, that's going to be affecting um, transcription, which essentially, in long story short, means protein production. So whether it's for cell growth or for enzymes, um, that would be what is happening there. Um, now the other choice for where our intracellular membrane could be would be on the mitochondria. We know the mitochondria is for running the Krebs cycle, so this would be for energy production. Okay. Um, but what we're really going to focus on are these membrane-bound receptors, because we have a couple of second me messenger systems that we need to look at, three second messenger systems that we need to look at. And these should be... Um, review to a certain extent from AMP1, at least to look a little bit familiar from AMP1. Um, the first two set of second messenger systems I have on the same page, because they're pretty similar to each other. Um, let's go for the first one over here first. Um, this would be adenyl cyclase and CAMP. CAMP would be considered the second messenger in this situation. So here's our cell, here's our receptor, there's the G protein. It's inactive until the hormone binds to that receptor that activates that receptor, it changes the shape of it, which activates the G protein. And once the G protein is activated, it activates the enzyme adenyl cyclase. Um, adenyl cyclase then will take ATP inside the cell and it will convert it into CAMP, um, which is our second messenger. So what CAMP does is it activates enzymes inside the cell or kinases, these are similar. They both have, um, you know, the protein structures that activate different processes inside the cell. Um, these would be stimulatory. So these are gonna stimulate the cell. Um, the effect of CAMP inside the cell is gonna depend on what the cell is, but it's going to be a stimulation sort of situation. So if this was, say, um, another gland, it would make more of whatever it is that that gland makes. If this were a cardiac muscle cell, it would cause a cardiac muscle cell to um, open ion channels and have an action potential. So it would stimulate whatever it is that this cell does. Um, so in order to have our negative feedback for this, so to stop the process once we've begun it, because you don't want to just bind the hormone just one time and have the cell be forever stimulated forever after. So you need to be able to turn it off. So phosphodiesterase is an enzyme that is found within cells and it breaks down the camp um, after it's done what it was supposed to do. So examples of hormones that use um, adenylocyclase and camp as their second messenger would be most of the hormones from your anterior pituitary, um, parathyroid hormone, which comes from your parathyroid glands, um, ADH, so antidiuretic hormone, this is coming from the posterior pituitary. It's made in the hypothalamus, but it comes from the posterior pituitary, and this helps to raise your blood pressure. Um, and then beta-1 adrenergic receptors. If you think back to AMP1 and you think of epinephrine and norepinephrine used as neurotransmitters, they use adrenergic receptors. Um, so this could be a beta-1 adrenergic receptor. The hormone in this case could be epinephrine or norepinephrine. When they are in the blood, they're just considered a hormone rather than a neurotransmitter. Um, and that could be this process here. For the second one, guanylocyclase and CGMP, it's very much the same. Just essentially, we're just using Gs for guanine instead of adenine, um, where we have over here. So. We have our receptor, the G protein is inactive, the hormone binds to the receptor, activates the G protein, that activates the enzyme guanylyl cyclase. Guanylyl cyclase takes um, GTP in the cell and it converts it into CGMP. That's our second messenger. Um, this is going to be 
a stimulation for the cell, so it will either activate the enzymes or the kinases, similar to what CAMP does, or it could hold open sodium channels, which allows sodium to come into the cell, causing an action potential in the cell, which if you think back to AMP1 and you think of your photoreceptors, they had CGMP holding those sodium channels open, um, which, you know, was an important part of photoreception. So whatever it is that the cell does, whether it's making glands, if it's a photoreceptor, whatever it is that this is doing, it's going to be a stimulation effect um, when, we, when we use the second messenger of CGMP. The negative feedback for that is the same. It's phosphodiesterase, same as it was for CAMP. So phosphodiesterase breaks down CGMP. Um, and examples of hormones that use this are atrial natriuretic peptide. This comes from the right atrium in your heart, and it helps to reduce your blood pressure. Okay, now our last second messenger system is the phospholipase C system. And it looks more complicated on the surface, but it really is just the same as the other two. It's just that there are two um, chemical reactions happening simultaneously, and they come together at the end. So that's, that's it. You just got two reactions in one is the whole thing. So it starts out the same. There's the receptor, there's the inactive G protein. The hormone binds to the receptor, activates the G protein. This is going to activate um, phospholipase C. Phospholipase C is going to take little bits, little membrane phospholipids, off of the cell membrane. It's not going to poke holes in them, but it's just going to take little snippets out of the cell membrane to help to activate two other enzymes. The two enzymes are inositol triphosphate, which we can abbreviate as IP3, and diacylglycerol, which we can abbreviate as DAG. Um, so let's follow IP3 first. They're both going to be happening at the same time, but let's follow IP3 first. What IP3 does is it goes to the endoplasmic reticulum in the cell. And inside the endoplasmic reticulum, you have a lot of calcium stored, so intracellular calcium. Um, on that endoplasmic reticulum, you have something called ryanidine channels. These ryanidine channels, if they open, allow calcium to come out. Um, you also have IP3 receptors, and that is where IP3 will bind. It will bind right to that IP3 receptor. That opens the receptor, and it also opens the ryanidine channel. Through both of those channels, um, calcium comes out. So out comes the calcium from storage. It's like the IP3 was just meant to go get calcium out of storage and put it out in the cytoplasm. That was its entire job. So now we're done with the whole IP3 thing. We got the calcium out. That was all it had to do. So let's go over and see what diacylglycerol is going to do. Um, what this is going to do is when the calcium comes out, so once the calcium has been released from the endoplasmic reticulum, it's going to interact with the diacylglycerol to activate protein kinase C which can be abbreviated as PKC. This is going to be what stimulates the cell. It activates the enzymes or the kinases. So um, where we're going to really see this was, is with a lot of hormones, where this would be a gland and another hormone would come in, activate phospholipase C, and cause the cell to make more of whatever um, hormone it is that this is going to be making. So examples of um, hormones that use this, so what this hormone could be, um, oxytocin. Oxytocin is made in the hypothalamus and released by the posterior pituitary, similar to ADH, but they have very different effects. Um, releasing hormones that come from the hypothalamus, most of them, all but one, use um, phospholipase C as our second messenger. We're going to do in our next video, um, learning all about these releasing hormones from the hypothalamus. Now the negative feedback for this is really just involving getting calcium out of the cytoplasm. Without the calcium, diacylglycerol can't activate the protein kinase C. So you just want to get the calcium either out of the cell or back into storage in the endoplasmic reticulum. So there will be ATP pumps for calcium found on the cell membrane to kick the calcium out of the cell. Um, or and, I should say end, on the endoplasmic reticulum to put it back into storage. And there's also something called the sodium calcium exchanger that you'll find on the cell membrane. This makes calcium go out of the cell and it trades it for a sodium going into the cell.
So the energy for this is provided by sodium going into the cell. Sodium likes to go into the cell. Calcium doesn't really want to go out of the cell, but it doesn't really have a choice because the sodium is providing the energy um, to kick it out of the cell. So um, this would be like a counter-transport mechanism that we saw from our last video. Um, so that's the negative feedback for those. So for our next video, we're going to be looking at the different hormones, um, focusing especially on the, um, the uh, hypothalamic releasing hormones and also inhibiting hormones, and then the anterior pituitary hormones, and a couple of other examples. Most of the rest are pretty self-explanatory. Um, but we're going to be looking at which second messenger they use, too, so putting it all together. So we're going to have a hormone and say, okay, it, it binds to a receptor and it does this, or it binds to a receptor and it does this. Okay, so that will be our next video.